I am honestly surprised how far back RPG roots stretch and how early the games were released, so I give you the best DOS RPGs by year, as voted by the Moby Games website users. Sure, some choices I may not agree with, but the list is hella interesting nonetheless, historically speaking. So, without further ado, let's see all the monsters slain, worlds conquered and princesses eaten by the dragons from 1981 onwards. The Wizard's Castle is arguably the very first DOS RPG. Sure, as compared to the titles that released just a couple of years later, it looks Spartan, beyond basic even. But don't let the text-based presentation fool you, cause what the system was capable of in 1981, it's a full-fledged RPG adventure. Naturally, it works on text parser, so I despise it and refuse to ever play it again. And there is no power on earth that could make me change my mind about it. That said, I believe I've only ever gave it few hours decades ago, so most of what I'll say will be based on what I found about it online. Parsers were never really my thing, it's nothing recent. And I was born in 1981, so I saw The Wizard's Castle both real and the game few years later, when we already had graphic RPGs. I hope that explains a lot. Anyway, the powerful wizard Zod forged the Orb of Power, a mystical and immensely powerful artifact of magic. As soon as he did, he vanished leaving it behind in his castle filled to the brim with monsters, traps and other treasures. It sounds weird this way. How about filled door to door with ungodly creatures and riches galore? Better. You play a role of an adventurer who takes the quest of obtaining said orb upon himself and heads off to the castle. The game starts with character creation with a standard spread of races of humans, elf, dwarfs and hobbits and can pick the starting gear too. After that, it's castle and you. And a lot of text. A wall's worth of text and a terrible, awful text parser. I mean, it's probably not that bad, but I hate those, so yeah. Anyway, if you want to see how the first RPG photos looked like, it's the one. Dungeon Quest Temple of Apsai is first in the whole series of so-called automated simulations Dungeon Quest games. It's a text-based role-playing with some very simple graphics to complement the gameplay. Other than that, it feels kinda like a mixture of Rogue and any other classic RPG. Cause on one hand, you're in this top-down maze like dungeon, but on another, it's not randomized and zoomed in, showing only your near surroundings. You are playing a solo character, however, and cannot make party of adventures. You explore a multi-level monster-filled dungeon, fighting anything and everything that you come across and collecting loot and treasures. Interestingly enough, being as early title as Temple of Afsai was, it used a very simple fatigue mechanic, which made you keep an eye on it at all times. Not to end up in combat when it's too low, as when it reaches 100%, you're immobilized for a while and the enemies could go to town on you. Naturally, as in most dungeons, in games, real or fantasy books and movies, they are filled with traps too. Now, this may be not as common as the enemies, but should definitely be avoided if possible. You can search for them if that helps. I hope it does. And there are also secret doors that led to hidden parts of the dungeon, so yeah, there's that. The element of discovery that so many of us love in RPGs. Perhaps simple and very, very early, but one nonetheless. Combat is turn-based and features two types of attack, weaker and stronger but riskier. Also an arrow shot from distance and parry. That said, some enemies can be spoken to and negotiated to not fight with you, which for 1982 is a very ambitious mechanic I must add, and I'm glad that it was implemented. The best thing about Dungeon Quest though, and cutest thing ever too, is the save game feature. And I kid you not, it requires you to write down your stats on a piece of paper and then re-enter them at character creation next time you want to play the game. So yeah, you're right, there's nothing stopping you from starting the game maxed out. I mean, there's no fun in that, but it's possible. I'm honestly not going to be coming back to those very old pre-Ultima games ever, so I can't recommend them, but if you feel like trying them out, by all means, knock yourself out. Ultima 2, a sequel to the first game, was a bigger and better title than the original. It featured larger town maps and ahead of its time concept of traveling through time games into different areas on Earth, effectively making it a four-dimensional game, so to speak. Storywise, an evil witch Minax, who coincidentally was also a pupil of previous game's antagonist Mundane, traveled back in time and changed the future so drastically that the world seemed to be doomed. It was discovered, however, that by her actions, rips in time, so-called time gates appeared all over the world, and through them it was possible to move within time. So, you are sent to the past to find Minax and defeat her, so that all the future destruction could be averted. This is the first out of few Ultima games that we'll talk about today, and same as the next few, it's huge. You can travel its world on foot, on horse, sail or even fly in space shuttle. It's gigantic. And if you add to it an epic overarching story that will touch multi-dimensional space-time continuum subjects and an underlying very deep and complex role-playing system, even if I gave it 10 times as much time as I have here, it's hardly unlikely I'd give it justice. 
so I won't, because we have a lot to cover. But I gotta do the bare minimum, right? So I'll try to quickly explain the basics. You travel the world viewed from a top-down perspective and fight enemies directly on the map with no separate battle screens of any kind. Cities have their own maps that you can enter and all the dungeons and towers are shown in very simplistic 3D view. Bottom part of the screen is used to issue commands, it also displays description of what's happening and results of your actions. The number of commands you can give to your character is staggering for the time and I doubt that there were many games in 1983 that could compare to Ultima 2 content-wise. It's worth mentioning that while there is an included built-in character, it's advised to make your own as not only you'll be in full control of the blueprint you'll be building upon, but also the one included is not the best. Rogue is a legendary RPG. Not only it was extremely feature-rich for the title from the very 80s, but also created a whole subgenre of RPGs, roguelikes. Games that see a singular protagonist seeking some kind of a big whoop or other mythical artifact, navigating dungeon of some sort, usually randomized, guaranteeing endless possible playthroughs, and battling it out with hundreds of monsters and enemies using wide selection of weapons and magic spells. All in a beautiful text mode graphics. And yeah, I mean it. I found those ASCII monsters enchanting back in the day. Sure, the subgenre evolved over the years, but it started in 1980 with Rogue on mainframes and 1984 on PC. In original Rogue, you're exploring the mysterious dungeon of Doom in search for the precious amulet of Yender. No relation to Star Wars Andor. Just saying. It features 26 different types of monsters symbolized by different letters, and each of them have unique abilities and types of attack. The deeper you go into the dungeon, the more convoluted they become, the stronger the monsters you'll encounter, and the better loot you'll find. And finally, that's probably the most important thing about this original and its whole subgenre, Rogue is a permadev game, meaning when you die, you die. End of story, no turning back, no retries, no penalties. It's the end. So, if you like roguelikes or even roguelites, it's worth learning where they came from. If you don't, then there are definitely better games in this video. Not for 1984 though, because it took it with ease. Not so long ago, a couple of minutes at most, I said that not many games could compare to Ultima 2. And here we are, with Ultima 3. The last in the first three-parter, the so-called Age of Darkness trilogy. Exodus takes place 20 years after a mysterious stranger, so you, so that we're clearly defeated Minax in Ultima 2, and much worse evil is about to bring doom to the land of Cesaria. Exodus, a half-demon, half-computer created by the Minax, and her former mentor Mundane, late quietly collecting data on how to get control over the kingdom. Now, as he regained consciousness, he awoke and ready to do it. Or it's ready to do it, I should say, really. The appearing of a volcanic island amidst the ocean and the word Exodus written in blood on a crewless ship announces the beginning of an end. Now, how epic is that? Not only these games touched very difficult subjects, but were also so incredibly deep and innovative. In Ultima 3, however, you do not need to lead a single hero anymore. A lone warrior, an indestructible demigod in the making, but a small group of up to four adventurers. And while it is possible to attempt to beat the game alone, it's much more difficult than it is even with a full team of four heroes. A lot has changed in the last 20 years, new towns emerged and the time rips disappeared, but in their stead, moon gates have raced in various places and they open at regular intervals, allowing for fast travel between far off places. While you don't travel through time anymore, Ultima 3 is a much more rounded up, complete package and arguably a better looking and playing title. It's as tough as the previous game was, but just a little bit easier to comprehend for a layman and an excellent adventure if you're up for the task of saving Sosaria once more. I think that starting simple is the way to go. So, Starflight is excellent. In essence, it's a sandbox space exploration, trading and combat game. Mix in equal amounts and devilishly addictive. I'd hate to draw too far comparisons, but you could say that it was kinda like Star Trek, cause you theoretically had no set path to follow, meaning you could divide your time freely between mining, combat and alien diplomacy. As you play more and more, however, an overarching plot will start to slowly emerge, and you'll discover that there was once an ancient advanced race of interstellar beings. And now they came back and for whatever the reason are causing stars to flare, destroying all living creatures in their vicinities. They're the space assholes of the universe. Starflight was a critical success and no wonder, as it was a very complex game in which you had to take numerous factors into consideration at all times. For instance, the crew that you hire at the beginning of the game for various positions on your ship had to be chosen keeping their base stats in mind so that they would be a good fit for tasks that they would then carry on out later. Those skills could be raised by means of training, so in time even a misfit could be transformed into a valued crew member. The game consists of 270 star systems that you can enter and 800 planets to land on. 
a ginormous universe for the time, especially that it was not empty. Starflight is probably one of the most unusual and interesting titles that released in 1986, and sure, it's not for everyone, but it definitely influenced a whole genre of space-based games that came out ever since then. If you thought that I was done talking about Ultima, then you're wrong. They dominated the early DOS RPG scene, and deservedly so, but I'm sure you'll want to know more. Many years after defeating the villain of the previous games, Mundane, the land of Sasaria was transformed quite literally. Continents rose and sank, and new cities were built on the ruins of old. The new kingdom was renamed Britannia, and was ruled by the honorable and peace-loving Lord British. Lord British, being the goody tissues that he was, wanted his kingdom to be just and ruled by principles of truth, courage and love, and proclaimed that whomever masters the eight virtues would serve as a spiritual leader and moral compass for all of Britannia. I don't know what's the salary for such job, but it had to be a good one, as many were after it. Anyway, the virtues are honesty, compassion, valor, justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality and humility, and they were the ones to be mastered. And you, playing as Avatar, a soon-to-be staple of the series, took this quest in a heartbeat. Unlike any other RPGs to date, your goal is not to defeat the villain or become the most powerful, feared or even good-looking, but to reach the highest level of understanding in all the virtues and then enter the so-called Stygian Abyss to gain access to the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. Ultima 4 introduced a very deep underlying system that kept track of all the virtues and your progress, meaning everything you do in the game influences their level somehow. So, for instance, overpaying for something or cheating a blind man would result in positive and negative change in few of the virtues respectively, same as staying in and fleeing combat would. Anyway, obviously, genre staples like combat with monsters, dungeons, magic shops, puzzles and everything else you'd expect from an RPG is still here, it's just the objective of the game that's entirely different and not centered around defeating an overwhelming force or terrible evil villain, but bettering oneself. Ultima 5 is the fifth title in Richard Garriott's series of role-playing games, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing about them, but they're amazing, and I'll mention them at least a couple of times more today, I'm sure of it. Anyway, once again, you're Avatar, and you have to save Lord British, and by doing so, Britannia as well. The kingdom is overtaken and ruled by a ruthless tyrant Blackford, who enforces previously mastered by your virtues on the populace, corrupting their meaning in the process and effectively creating a fantasy police state. You know, Orwell's 1984, but hundreds of years earlier, with magic and not on earth. That kind of a thing. And in the new Britannia, adhering to the virtues is punishable by death. I mean, as all good or efficient, I should say, real dictators will tell you, removing someone from a position of opposition is easier than changing their mind. So I heard. Ultima 5 uses the same engine as the previous title did, and most of the gameplay mechanics like turn-based combat are unchanged as well. There are some novelties though, cities for one are considerably expanded in size and many unique items and buildings are represented graphically now. You can push and pull certain objects, and there is a full working day-night cycle. Also, and finally, dialogue trees are more detailed and feature various topics to converse about. If you're a fan of RPGs, I really don't have to say more. If you're not though, Ultima is unlikely to change your mind about them because of its very simple utilitarian aesthetics. Sierra's Heroes Quest So You Want to Be a Hero is an unusual, at least for Sierra, title. It's not just an adventure game, like most of the releases were, because it's also heavily rooted with its design in RPG. Meaning that aside from your usual adventure foray of finding characters to talk to, performing small and big favors for them, solving puzzles and actively by me hated text parser, you're also partaking in combat and developing your character's skills. At the beginning of the game you pick a class of out of three staples of the genre, fighter, mage or thief, and that choice will not only influence combat, but also many different events and situations throughout the entire game. Puzzles that you'll encounter and ways to solve them. It's a unique and involving premise and one that guaranteed title success upon its release. Additionally, there is a full day-night cycle and hunger tiredness system. Both perhaps not something totally unseen, but definitely not everyday choices in gaming. So yeah, Heroes Quest is perhaps the only one of early Sierra's titles I could actually find myself enjoying to some degree, forgetting about the parser lost in the adventure. Ultima 6 The False Prophet is considered one of the best and most important role-playing games in the entire history of gaming. It offers pretty good graphics for the time with colorful VGA top-down view, a vast non-linear branching story and world as open as virtually none other at the time. 
to the point that you could actually forfeit the main quest entirely and immerse yourself in it, performing seemingly pointless tasks, living your life in Britannia, baking goods or fishing among many other boring everyday activities. You didn't have to follow the main quest line at all, and you could just get lost in the world for hours. I mean, it's obviously advisable to carry on with the plot, but not necessary. One of the biggest changes between Ultima 6 and earlier titles was the change of in-game perspective, which was now single plane top-down semi-isometric view without any separate screens for towns, cities or dungeons. That all, instead of being icons on the main map as previously, are de facto locations and parts of the main map now. This choice makes Ultima a much more immersive than it would have otherwise be. Storywise, after being saved by his friends in the nick of time, Avatar learns that Britannia has been invaded by an odd race of gargoyles that occupied shrines of virtue and are not planning on leaving anytime soon. That said, as the game progresses, he learns that rather than killing them all, it's better to find a way to bring the long-lasting peace between the two races. Ultima 6 is an absolute classic, and a title that most fans of the RPG know about, and those that don't should definitely look it up. Might and Magic 3 Isles of Terra is the best and most modern in its design and presentation out of all legendary classic Might and Magic games. It's also a first-person party-based role-playing with tile-based movement and turn-based combat. It's the first title in the series that supports mouse control, which may not have been a novelty in 1991, but for the series in particular, it most definitely was something that made lives of players much easier and interface more ergonomic. It features an auto-mapping system and maps larger than previously available, exceeding original limit of 16 by 16 squares. You may not know or remember about the limit, as it's the first game in the series that I've spoke about today, but Ultima games were a tough nut to crack and hardly anything could compare to them. The biggest new feature of Might and Magic, however, was the ability to save game virtually anywhere, short of one location in the entire game, which removed the requirement for players to constantly keep looking for ins in mind, as saves could only be made there previously. I realized that I said nothing about the story and it's heavily rooted in the previous two titles, but I'll try to do my best. The world of Terra unexpectedly bears witness to a battle between its guardians, Korak and Sheltem. Well, to be honest, only Sheltem was a guardian of Terra, but since he revolted against the powerful race of ancients, took their space-traveling nacelles, hurling them to their deaths into the suns of other planets, it's now up to you and a group of your adventuring companions to help Korak defeat the corrupted Sheltem. Given that Might and Magic 3 is still considered as one of the best RPGs of all time, I suppose it's best not to spoil it and you should learn the rest of the story all by yourself. Ultima 7 Part 1 The Black Gate is a vast and captivating role-playing game and a follow-up to the long-running series by Biden legendary Richard Garriott. It is also a first, or one of the first, in many things that we take for granted in modern RPGs today. Design-wise, that is. It's the first Ultima using a top-down worldview that fills up the entire screen. It's also first to introduce deep and by the unseen true-to-life NPCs scheduling, meaning their lives are fully planned out, simulated, and they're going about their daily business as if you weren't there. So they go to work, after which they may visit a tavern for a drink or two, but don't have to, and then they eventually go back home to sleep before another busy day. It may not seem like much now, but back then, when NPCs in most games just stood around in one spot for days on end like stone pillars, never sleeping, resting or leaving their post, this seemingly small change made you feel as if you were a part of a larger living world that kept going whether you were there to witness it or not. Additionally, it was the first title in the series to introduce full mouse-driven drag and drop on all of the in-game objects and real-time combat. Unlike previous games in the series, you don't control a full party, but only our main hero, Avatar, and all of your companions that you will no doubt meet many of, because of your magnetic personality, act on their own without any input on your end. And finally, Ultima 7 is the first title that was not only split into identically numbered parts, but each of them had a separate unique and its own add-on expansion. Interesting fact to keep a note of, if Avatar and his companions don't eat regularly in Ultima 7, they will die. You know, like in real life. Anyway, Ultima 7 starts up in your quote-unquote real world, where you sit at your computer and suddenly out of nowhere receive a mysterious message on your PC screen from a being claiming to be a guardian, and telling you that the Britannia entered a new age of enlightenment and soon everyone will bow to its new ruler, yourself included. A moment later, a Moongate materializes and you enter through to once again, as Avatar, save the kingdom from impending doom. Now how cool is that?
Lens of Lord The Throne of Chaos is a real-time first-person dungeon crawling RPG and a nice flawless game perfectly balancing role-playing mechanics with fun gameplay, captivating storytelling and very accessible controls. You're a hero who by request of King Richard of Gladstone have to find and defeat evil shapeshifting sorceress Scotia. I don't know if you've ever tried to find the shapeshifter, but it's rather difficult. I've seen some movies, I've read some books and heard some stories. I know what I'm talking about. Dungeon crawling and combat in Lands of Lore is pretty much identical to that of Eye of Beholder series of games, which frankly is not bad, as they were solid and fun titles in their own right. Leveling up has been heavily streamlined, however, and is semi-automatic, with skills raising with use, or rather with killing of enemies, and falling into one of three categories – fighting, magic and rogue. Rather vague naming, but understandable to all veterans of the genre. In the course of the adventure, you'll be able to add two other characters to your party for a total of three, and you can freely equip them with weapons and armor as you see fit. Later, CD release featured full speech, and Patrick Stewart voiced King Richard, which, you know, is always something worth mentioning as the man is legend. Not only as Captain Jean-Luc Picard, but also as anything else that he ever touches. Now that sounded surprisingly creepy. Superhero League of Hoboken is a humorous role-playing adventure hybrid and one of the weirdest games I've ever seen in this already unusual mix of genres. A very good one to be clear and not weird because it's bad, broken or unplayable. Anyway, the northeastern United States is reduced to post-apocalyptic toxic wasteland and your crimson tape. An excellent name for a vigilante, I must add, a leader of a group of superheroes. Toxic pollution and numerous wars have reduced the US to dangerous badlands, filled with mutants and other generic comic book villains, with occasional city-states serving as beacons of hope and civilization in these otherwise wild wastelands. You will have to complete increasingly more difficult missions assigned by the so-called Commissioner to eventually face and defeat evil Dr. Entropy, the main body of the game and a disappointingly named villain. Your unique power is the ability to create organizational charts, yes, you heard that right, and as you progress through the game, more heroes with equally as hilarious gifts will join your team. And some of these are really something else, like the ability to see through pizza boxes or aura of lethargy and dullness that can instantly put many opponents to sleep. Not to mention fan favorite Iron Tummy, whose uncanny skill allows him to eat any kinds of spicy food without any intestinal distress. I mean, no curries, chilies or ghost peppers can stand in the man's way. He's so cool. You can have up to nine of those heroes in your team. Completing missions will reward experience points, which in turn will let you level them up, raising their powers and skills considerably. Overworld traversal takes place in top-down view, and combat encounters play out in first-person turn-based mode, just like the way I like them. Superhero League of Hoboken is honestly one of the most original and unique games of the 1990s, and all fans of RPGs should do themselves a huge favor and give it a go, because it's probably one of the best sleeper games they've never heard of. Jagged Alliance is a turn-based tactical strategy role-playing mixture. It combines excellent tactical squad-level ground combat similar to that of XCOM, with unprecedented level of personalities and RPG elements. Story-wise, you're tasked with recapturing an island of Metavira from an evil man called Lucas, who took it over for himself to harvest extremely rare and profitable sap from trees growing on it. You are, however, working on a very limited budget that is entirely dependent on the amount of sap that is extracted from the recaptured areas. The game is divided into two parts. First is strategic, shows the map of the entire island divided into sectors and your actions here, like moving your mercenaries between sectors for instance, all happen in real time. And second is turn-based, close-up top-down view tactical layer that the game switches to for combat and mission encounters. Each of your mercs has a limited set of action points per each turn of combat and they can be used for anything, any number of times, as long as they're still available. The mercs are hired for a set period of time and paid on a day-by-day basis. They are not, however, faceless soldiers, but individual characters from all around the world, each with their own personalities and quirks. Some are cowardly, others maniacally bloodthirsty, and they will all react differently throughout the combat in response to its progress. And that's just the tip of an iceberg, as they all being a part of an international merc guild also have opinions and rapport with each other, and can straight up refuse to work with one another or perform especially well together if their personalities align. While not unknown per se, Jagged Alliance was often overlooked in favor of other titles, and that's a mistake, as it's a gem unlike many. And what if I tell you that I haven't even mentioned dozens upon dozens of available weapons and special items, different mission types, improvements to stats for mercs after missions, and excellent enemy AI that responds to combat situations in a natural and intelligent way, and the plot that organically reacts to and unfolds in response to your progress in game. Yep, that's Jagged Alliance, one of the very best games not only of 1995, but of all time. 
Taking place in the provinces of Hyrok and Hammerfell of Tamriel, Daggerfall is a successor to Bethesda's Arena, in a game titled after Hyrok's capital city. Like with most Bethesda's games, you can be sure of three things. First, that it released full of bugs, which it is, and it actually took several patches originally to get the game to the point where it wouldn't hang seemingly on random. Secondly, that it's an open-ended title that allows for complete freedom of choice of where to go and what to do next, and does not require you to follow the main storyline whatsoever. And finally, you can bet that the game is big. And it is. Huge, actually. I believe that to this day, it offers the single biggest game world of any game ever made that was not set in space. Even if majority of the world is generated and populated randomly. Daggerfall, in fact, may be the biggest Bethesda's game content-wise too. It allows you to join many political and social organizations, so guilds, or try to get better and better pursuing power of your own. You can buy houses, horses and even ships, and you can become a werewolf, werebore or a vampire. Sadly, you can't become a spider pig or man bat. So you know. Top half of a bat and men's bottom, but that's supposedly coming in Elder Scrolls 6. Don't check that, trust me. And you can interact with literally thousands of NPCs. Granted, given the game's random nature, most of those interactions are superficial, but they're there, so that's something. Daggerfall doesn't scheme on details with your character either, it can come from any of the nine provinces of Tamriel, and they don't only differ in race, but also kind of a character they are. Meaning, not all are human. There are also 18 classes to choose from, with numerous primary and secondary skills. When you create your character, you can skip picking a particular class, however, and make your own by selecting all skills and abilities by hand as you please. Not many games from other developers allowed for such freedom of choice, and not many do even to this day. Especially that it's a two-edged sword. You can create a character that could potentially be much better than any of the ones included, a demo I got even, but you can also make one that's going to end up being borderline unplayable, dying left and right whenever any enemy farts around it. All skills, primary and secondary, are raised with use rather than arbitrary levels, so the more you jump, the higher you'll be able to jump, the more you swing your sword, the stronger the swings will be, and will connect more often, and so on and so on and so on. It's the best system that any RPG could use in my opinion, as it mimics real life as best as it's possible. The combat is entirely real-time and you use your melee and ranged weapons by holding the right mouse button and performing various moves with your mouse. This was rather new and interesting idea in 1996, but also a really bad one. It made combat unnecessarily stressful and clunky, as you could never really tell if a miss was a lack of skill or your failure at swinging. Some things are better left less realistic than others, it seems. The game features magic too, and upon getting Mage's Guild membership, you'll be able not only to buy spells, but also receive appropriate training and make your own spells as well. They help with identification of magical weapons too, so that's also worth keeping in mind. Graphically, Daggerfall is not a show-off, but given the scope of the game, I think it can be forgiven as the sheer amount of content more than makes up for it. I haven't said anything about the story yet, as you may have noticed, and I won't. I won't rob you of experiencing it firsthand. War. War never changes. And the great nuclear war that wiped most of life of the face of the Earth was no different. Brutal, devastating, but also a short one. It took but a day to lay devastation to our world. And what emerged after was a wasteland, with small remote communities spread over large distances, split with patches of radioactive wastes, full of dangers, raiders and mutants of various kinds. You're an inhabitant of one of the vaults, large pre-war bunkers that were supposedly built to hold large chunks of population safe after nuclear holocaust. Yours, Vault 13, however, had its water chip broken. A purification control chip without which the vault has no access to clean water. So you're sent into the wastes to find the replacement. And you have 150 days to do so. Initially, as if you play your cards right, you can double it during one of the quest lines. Fallout is a post-apocalyptic RPG set in a wasteland of what was once US West Coast. The game world is entirely free to explore from the get-go and you can go anywhere you'd like. It doesn't mean that you're equipped to deal with what you will find there, but you can go wherever you feel like. The main quest is interesting and will take you through a series of hoops to complete, but it's not overly long. Fallout's death and length comes from hundreds of side quests, big and small, that are scattered throughout the whole game world and enhance the gameplay experience making it feel more immersive and characters you meet more real. Fallout features very fun and well-designed turn-based combat system and uses action points as a basis for all the movement and attacks during encounters. You can attack aiming your shots or swings depending on the weapon at various body parts of all enemies. And that choice can result in increased accuracy or critical chances. After all, head is much more fragile appendix than the arm. But since we're on the combat, the game is built in a way that allows completing it without ever actually fighting by either avoiding or running from encounters and solving conflicts by conversations, provided your skills would allow for that. 
Fallout is the first title in my most beloved series of role-playing games and in my personal opinion, excellent choice of Moby Games users for the best role-playing of 1997. As you saw, some of the choices may have been questionable as they were more of a hybrid kind of games rather than pure RPGs. So titles like Heroes Quest or Jagged Alliance. But since they had a lot of RPG in them and were the user's picks, I decided not to set a precedence and exclude them. Ultima had an incredibly strong showing too, dominating the first half of the list. I mean, it deserved to do so, but it's still interesting how such a huge series could basically disappear into non-existence by today. Oh well, it is what it is. More importantly though, how did you like the Moby Games' RPG choices? Would you change any of the games on the list? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.